Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us for this very special legislative preview. It's the first of three legislative previews that we're doing here with the Connecticut Mirror. I'm John Dankoski, and I'm pleased to be joined by Mark Pasniokas, the Capitol Bureau Chief of the Connecticut Mirror. Tonight's event is made possible in part through the support of CBIA. You can learn more about CBIA's 2023 Transform Connecticut Policy Solutions at CBIA.com. And we should say that this is the third year in a row that CBIA has sponsored this event, and we can't thank them enough for their support over the many years we've been doing these public events on policy and politics in the state. We would also like to thank the President's College at the University of Hartford for hosting this event at the Wild Auditorium. And if you want to know more about their lifelong learning program, you can check out their spring 2023 program at hartford.edu slash PC. Now, as I mentioned, this is the first in a series of legislative preview events. The others are coming up in just the next few weeks. Session number two is a reporter roundtable. I'll be joined by Erica Phillips, who's the Connecticut Mirror's economic development reporter, uh, the housing and children's issues reporter, Jenny Monk, and justice reporter, Jaden Edison, to talk about some potential legislation to look out for this session on their beats. That's happening next Tuesday, January 31st at 7 p.m. It is a Zoom only event. Uh, and then session number three is Keith Vanoff's big budget review. He's got, a, he's got a great title for his pass. We didn't come up with a better title for yours. Uh, that's, of course, the Mirror State Budget Reporter Keith Faniff, um will be talking about budget battles expected during this legislative session. That's happening on Wednesday, February 15th. Maybe something to think about around Valentine's Day for you and someone you love. It's also at 7 o'clock. It is a Zoom event. Um, you can register for both of these at ctmirror.org. And when you go to ctmirror.org, I always like to tell people that that is a perfect time that you can support the nonprofit, nonpartisan journalism that the Mirror provides and has provided for so many years. You can just click that big donate button and make your contribution today. Um, for the folks in this audience, you can feel free to ask some questions of Mark, who's going to be regaling you with tales of the state capitol and telling you a little bit about what's happening in policy and politics. We're also going to be taking some questions from our audience on Zoom as well. As always, it's a nice, quick hour, and so maybe we can get right to it. Paz, first of all, good to see you. Good to see you. It's also, it's also nice that you decided to dress slightly different than me. Last time we did one of these, we were literally dressed exactly the same with the exact same beard. And it was it was strange for people, to be honest with you. But it's it's good that you mix things up a little bit. It was decidedly uncomfortable. <laughs> it was decidedly uncomfortable. Um, let's talk about the big picture here. What was the last time we talked, we were talking a lot about the impact of the election. Now that we've gotten a little closer uh, or a little further away from the election and into this legislative session here, um, what was the impact of the election on what's happening at the Capitol right now? Well, as far as the personnel, um, it did not have a big change. We have the same governor. We have the same leaders of the four caucuses, the same leaders of the two chambers, the House and Senate. But there are 36 new members. Um, one of the things we saw in the last election is the Democrats um, now represent Greenwich, in the House, um, it, the Republicans are barely holding on to seats in the House in Fairfield County. So one of the questions is, what will that mean to the House Democratic uh, agenda in particular? Matt Ritter, the Speaker of the House, um, I would describe him as a pragmatic leader um, by Connecticut Democratic standards, perhaps even a centrist. Um, Leading a caucus uh, the size of the House, I think, is one of the more challenging tasks in politics. We certainly see that in Washington. Um, and it's funny because when the Democrats once again won huge majorities after really being close to 50-50 um, not so long ago, uh, Vinnie Candelora, the House Republican leader, said, everybody's looking at me to explain the challenges of running the House Republican caucus. But he said, I think Ritter has the tougher job because of the diversity in his caucus. So how do you marshal a caucus that large on issues, uh, on social issues, certainly tax issues? 
um, if they get into affordable housing? Uh, do the, does anybody dare to mess around with local control over zoning, which is certainly a hot button issue? So, you know, it's so it's the same as far as the balance of power. The governor, though, is now uh, he indicated in his state of the state address um, a sense of fleeting time. Um, he so far has not put forward um, really an aggressive agenda. His first term, people, anybody who comes to an event like this, I don't have to go really deep in the background of, of Connecticut recent political history, but his first year was really an unmitigated disaster in the fact that his one bold proposal was the return of highway tolls to stabilize infrastructure spending. Um, and he ended that first year as the, you know, the least pop, one of the least popular governors in the United States based on, on polling. A year later, COVID comes, the legislature goes away. Uh, and at the end of 2020, he ends up as one of the more popular governors in Connect I mean, in the country and well positioned for a re-election victory, you know, very unusual in Connecticut, which is used to close races. He ends up with a 13 point win. Now the question is, what is he gonna do with it? Um, was there a mandate? He ran really on um, almost a Charlie Baker platform of fiscal discipline, fiscal responsibility, not really a lot of big things. Um, and people are waiting to see at the Capitol with his budget uh, in February, what will be the big policy initiatives? He certainly um, dropped one today, or at least the outline of one in trying to tackle um, what Connecticut does with solid waste, not the sexiest of issues, but very important environmentally and, and financially. You know, Connecticut is projected to be shipping close to 900,000 tons of trash a year out of state. So they're trying to figure out how, what to do with it. Well, and maybe we can use that as a jumping off point to just learn a little bit more uh, for people who really don't understand inside the governor's office who Ned Lamont is. So with an issue like this, there are an awful lot of, of people in environmental communities in the state who've been talking for an awful lot about uh, trash incineration, talking about how we get rid of, of waste. It, it seems to me as though this isn't a reaction necessarily to any of that. This is a little bit more of an, an economic idea. We want to keep our waste in state. We want to figure out how to deal with it ourselves. Well, the issue is forced in this case by the decision that the Lamont administration did make two years ago not to put more money into the what used to be CRRA, but the MIRA, um, not Connecticut MIRA, M-I-R-A, materials. Uh, what does that stand for? I'm forgetting now. And I wrote it today. <laughs> but the trash energy plant in the South Meadows of Hartford. And once that decision was made, it, it is set in motion, really. Um, it's not, as, as one of the state reps who was at the press conference today said, it's not an emergency yet. It's not a crisis, but it's at an inflection point where the state needs to start doing some pretty complicated and I think politically difficult things. You know, one of the things we're talking about is reducing the waste stream, which means retraining much of Connecticut on what you do with your waste, um, um, pressure on um, Amazon and other businesses to reduce packaging. The hope is to reduce the waste that's produced by 40% over five years or so. And then the question is, what do you do with the remaining 60%? And there's probably going to be a new trash or energy plant of some kind, technology to be determined. But that means citing uh, a trash to energy plant somewhere in Connecticut. Um, the administration made very clear today, um, Hartford's off the hook, that Hartford, after 100 years of handling a good portion of the state's waste yeah. uh, in the landfill in the North Meadows and in the trash energy plant, that uh, they're going to look elsewhere. They're going to look else elsewhere, but that means a, a lot of the rest of the state that isn't going to exactly welcome a project like that. You don't think? No. I, I would, I would, I would guess not. Well, and in, but there you have it. It's, it's one of the uh, very tricky political issues that he has to deal with if he's going to deal with um, Democrats in his caucus from towns like 
Greenwich. If he's going to, you know, all of a sudden now, there's a whole lot of places that he has to worry about in the state. Not that the governor of the state wasn't always worried about all of Connecticut's residents, but it is a little different to, to govern in a in charge of a Democratic Party that really does look a little different and has tentacles in different parts of the state than they have before. Well, I mean, this governor has always been um, not your standard Democrat, right? Um, people, he, he burst onto the scene as a candidate, uh, as an anti-war candidate against Joe Lieberman in 06, but that kind of papered over the fact that, look, he's at his heart, he is a Greenwich businessman. He is uh, not somebody who wants to see a steeply progressive uh, tax code, which many members of his party would like to see. Um, he has, again, spent the last three years um, benefiting from the surpluses as well as the federal aid that has come in. But he's really, again, I keep going back to the Charlie Baker line because there were plenty of Republicans over the years who said to me, what we need is a Charlie Baker. Well, Connecticut got a Charlie Baker, but he's a Democrat. And like Charlie, he's reasonably progressive on social issues. Um, he has been pretty good with labor, although perhaps as somebody here might disagree, I don't know. And, but, you know, on the minimum wage, paid family medical leave, um, uh, certainly defended the right to organize prevailing wage, uh, pretty much the canon of a lot of labor stuff in Connecticut, um, while resisting um, some of the newer things, you know, um, working, uh, work schedules, having that dictated by the state, that kind of thing. But, but again, he, he is not in sync with certainly the progressive wing of his party. And we're, we will see how that tension plays out this session. This is the first normal session, really, um, really, you know, in a while. He had 2019, which again was a bad year for him. 2020, um, he signed one bill into law in 2020 out of the regular session because the legislature went home in March of 2020 for what they said would be a long weekend to do a deep cleaning of the building. And that turned into a hell of a cleaning. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and I want to talk about that in just a little bit, because I think um, the way that lawmakers do their work at the Capitol has changed a little bit. I, I want to put a pin in that and come back to that in a second. We are getting some questions on Zoom. And if you're on Zoom right now watching uh, this conversation, you can take part by using that Q&A function in just a moment. We'll get to some questions from our audience here at the Wild Auditorium at the University of Hartford. Uh, Betty writes, the recovery for all coalitions agenda calls for equity for all, which includes raising taxes on millionaires to add more money for healthcare services, public education, et cetera. Do you think this is something the General Assembly can get behind? I think we're fairly certain Governor Lamont might not be able to get, get behind it. What sort of movement on taxation is happening to the legislature this year? The Senate Democrat, the Senate Democrats are more inclined to pursue that. Um, the House is more of a, a mixed bag. Um, it's early; it's too early to get a sense of which of these things will kind of catch fire. Um, there's a certain organic element to how a session goes. You know, um, it's a little bit you know like in sports where people talk about you know what has momentum. That's a real thing at the Capitol. What has momentum? Um, people will float ideas. They will see what the reaction is. Um, but the recovery for all agenda is something that, uh, you know, major elements of the governor is not in, in sync with. Now, there's an experiment going on in Massachusetts as a result of a referendum. They doubled the tax rate, income tax rate on millionaires. Um, Massachusetts generally has lower income tax rates than Connecticut, but that certainly puts the top rate above Connecticut. New York and New Jersey are also above Connecticut. And Connecticut always, whether it was under Dan Malloy before Lamont or others, you know, Connecticut always keeps an eye on what the tax rates are of, of those states when they look at how high can they go on the income tax. But, you know, Lamont is, you know, he's a loyal reader of the Wall Street Journal, and it means a lot to him to get editorials that don't kick the crap out of Connecticut, which have been the case for 20 years, really. And Lamont, Malloy before him to a certain degree, they are sensitive to how Connecticut is described um, to Wall Street and the broader business community. 
Um, so, you know, keep that in mind when you look at this governor, that is in the back of his head. He wants this state to be seen as friendlier to business. He wants economic growth to really be um, goal one for him. Outside of the economics of this, I'm wondering what else you think Governor Lamont is going to get behind this legislative session that maybe does give a little bit more to the liberal wing of the Democratic Party. I know that you've written about uh, the governor deciding that he wants to uh, get behind more firearms bans, whether or not he wants to step into abortion control, abortion access. I guess I'm just wondering where you think he might uh, be able to give something back to some of the people in his caucus that well, feel that that they would like more from him. That's where he, I think he's generally more comfortable playing. So he has, he put a proposal out the other day. He wants to ban open carry. Connecticut, uh, currently, it is legal. If you have a permit uh, to carry a firearm, you can carry it. I don't know what the rule is at University of Hartford because Connecticut does allow um, private property owners to set their own rules. But generally speaking, um, there is nothing in state law that bars somebody who owns uh, a grandfathered AR-15 from walking down Main Street with an AR-15 um, over their shoulder. Um, it does not happen that often in Connecticut. It is the way we have seen in some other states, including protests at state capitals during uh, pe people who are challenging um, uh, the election results, you know, the election deniers. Um, those pictures are pretty startling if you're in Connecticut. The Connecticut Capitol um, firearms, other than you know, carried by Capitol Police, are banned in the Capitol and on the Capitol grounds. So to see these pictures of large, really large crowds of people holding semi semi-automatic uh, long guns was was pretty startling. So in any event, he wants to ban open carry. You, if you have a permit for a gun, you could still buy and possess a gun and carry it and just have it. Mm -hmm. where you can't see it. Um, the police think that's also a help because right now, if they see somebody with a gun on the street, um, they they really don't have a right to go and challenge them about it. So, you know, that's something law enforcement wants to see as well. He's also talking about um, limiting car, uh, gun purchases to one a month. The idea being um, you want to thwart or discourage straw purchases. People would go in and buy a dozen guns and then turn around and sell them, or in some cases would, would sell them and then report them stolen. Are, are these proposals that he can get through the leg legislature? I think I think these have a real chance to go forward. Um, there's an irony here that when the General Assembly tried to pass a law giving police the right to ask a, a permit holder mm -hmm. to show their permit. You know, there was after the theater shooting in Aurora, Colorado, there was a gentleman in a movie theater in New Haven who had a gun on his on his belt. And obviously there were people who got concerned about what he was up to. And the cops came in and asked to see the permit. And under current law, you don't have to show the permit. So now the cop is in the position of it's legal to have a gun. Is there a law? Is there a law broken? So there was an effort to at least give police the right to demand a permit. That turned into a huge, huge thing, including um, people saying, well, that could be used for racial profiling. Would it be, would it be handled uh, in an even-handed way? So this goes past it. Mm -hmm. It's stricter, but it, it it's it's simpler. I mean, there's a certain uh, beauty to it in that respect. Um, it's just okay. You you can't have open carry. Yeah, um, we do have a couple of questions coming in. One actually gets to something that I wanted to talk to you about anyway. And uh, Fred asks, please describe some of the factions among uh, Democrats and Republicans in the Connecticut Legislature. You mentioned this before. Uh, there are factions within the Democrats. You use shorthand to talk about Fairfield County versus the rest of the state, but also factions within the Republican Party. Maybe you just talk a little bit about what we see there and what might be different than in years past. Let's start with the Republicans, since there are fewer of them. Um, but there has been um, a conservative caucus for years now. In fact, uh, Vinnie Kendall or the House Republican leader used to be a member of the conservative caucus. But like Speaker Ritter, Representative Kindler, I would call um, more of a pragmatist who views his position now as the leader of the caucus, 
as one um, to bring the caucus together when they do have caucus positions, and those are usually on financial matters. But there is, well, one of the things you look for as a reporter when you want to see if these caucuses have a personality or if there's something evolving. So one of the obvious questions in Connecticut is, uh, is there an element of what we see nationally um, kind of taking root in Connecticut? And to do that, I look at what issues and what bills are being put forward. So there are some echoes, relatively faint echoes of what we're seeing nationally. You see bills filed um, that would um, bar transgender students from competing um, in girls sports, interscholastic sports. You see some bills um, that would require um, transgender kids to identify in certain official documents by um, their biological identity as opposed to how they identify now. Um, you do see the leadership of the Republican caucus um, putting bills forward on um, uh, addressing how to have greater, greater parental involvement in schools, which on its face is a fairly neutral idea. You know, if you have kids, you were involved in, in your schools. I certainly recall a conversation or two with a teacher about curriculum and whatnot. But this comes in a larger context of, is that a political winner of of trying to um, mobilize a base around these issues of parental involvement, which they have echoes of critical race theory and some well, other things. Well, let me just go back to that. It, interesting though, Sue, in, in, in part, there's some of these bills are coming out of factions of the Republican party that aren't really being supported by leadership, I, I would assume, when you talk about transgender youth. And some that, seem more benign on their face that are coming out of leadership. Bob Stefanowski uh, just got his butt handed to him by Ned Lamont in the last election. And whether it was Stefanowski's campaign directly or people who were supporting the campaign, there was an awful lot of talk about parental involvement in schools. A lot of these same issues kind of were losers for Republicans in the last election. And I guess I'm just wondering what Republicans at the state capitol are saying about that right now, if they're going right back to that well with some bills. Well, like I said, the, the bills that leadership has signed off on, Republican leadership, are modest steps in those areas compared to what we see nationally. I sure. want to be clear about that. Um, and also offer a bit of context, which is, the Republicans in Connecticut, um, under Kendall Laura, under Themis Claritas before him, Larry Caffaro before her. Um, let's just briefly go back to the 2008, where it was a blowout for Democrats. There were only 37 um, seats in the House won by Republicans that night out of 100. 2008 was a long time ago, wasn't it? But 37 <laughs> yeah. seats. So yeah. here's where the Republicans. Here's where the Republicans were very smart and where they made ground. They went from 37 seats in the House to they came within five of a majority in the 2016 election. In the Senate, they won half the seats. Mm -hmm. That was huge. But Trump was also elected the 2016 election. And in 2018, um, he turned out to be the best organizer the Democratic Party in Connecticut's ever had. And mobilize a democratic base. It, I think it, it accelerated a trend we already saw in some of the wealthier communities of Fairfield County going towards the Democrats. So that happened. But I think, I think the Republicans in the House, the leadership still by and large are focused on, on fiscal issues. Um, they are pointing to the surpluses Connecticut has and said, do we really need a highway use tax? which you know, would be applied to trucks, but that trickles down to consumers pretty quickly. Um, they wanna tweak the sales tax, get rid of um, the 1% added tax on prepared meals and, and restaurants. Um, so there is still a focus to a degree on fiscal responsibility, but 
they've been undercut to a degree by the Democratic governor, mm -hmm. you know, whereas previously, um, you know, they were, they kind of had that field more or less to themselves. So talk, if you would, then about maybe the factions on the Democratic side. You mentioned the Republicans a little bit. So that's still evolving. So at this point in the session, you know, we have 2,400 bills roughly that have been filed already. Um, and don't anybody try to quiz me on them. Um, 2,400 bills filed so far? Yeah. Is that, is that normal over the course of it, this many days? I have not compared the number to the previous years. I can tell you what generally passes in a long session. So this is the year in which is a five five month session. And you know, two years ago, there were 240 bills, I think, that made it across the finish line. So that means maybe 10% of these bills will get through. Now, a lot of them are repetitious. Um, you have a lot of people who did the same thing because in the long session, individual legislators have more freedom to um, propose their bills as opposed to in the short session where it kind of goes through the committee process and they're supposed to be more fiscally oriented. Um, so you see a lot of bills that are repetitious. There are several bills that would reinstate the death penalty. You know, that's not going anywhere, not with a Democratic majority and not with this governor. Um, but there are bills people put in because they want to make a statement or they made a promise during a campaign and now they are fulfilling that promise. So that accounts in part for the large number. Uh, and the fact that there are three dozen new people um, in the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we, we got a, a couple questions coming in, but I, I do want to say that if you have any questions here in the Wild Lot of Term, just raise your hand. We've got a couple of uh, microphone holders, producers, uh, from the Connecticut Mirror, who can uh, watch to see and and maybe get your your question to Mark. I want to talk about what's changed since COVID in terms of the way that the legislature does its work. As you said, there's just like the one bill that the governor signed the one year when everything was was down. Work was being done remotely. It was very difficult to get work done. I think a lot of us have had the experience that something about our life has changed since COVID other parts of our life have gone back to normal. Because I'm wondering what parts of the work at the legislature have really changed significantly or even in a minor way and which have just gone back to normal. It sounds like 2,400 bills means they're still cranking away, but I'm sure some things in the day-to-day -day have changed. Actually, there are. And um, it's interesting that in not so much 2020, but certainly in 2021, the fact that the Capitol still was by, it was more or less closed to the public. Um, almost everything except actual sessions of the House and Senate were done virtually. And that became um, a really partisan issue. The Republicans um, were, were very critical of the Democrats, particularly the Senate Democratic leadership, um, which insisted on, on keeping the building closed. Um, Fast forward though now, um, it is far less polarized and there is a consensus about some of the things that were done out of necessity in 2020 and perhaps into 21 um, and 22 um, make sense. And so we we now have a building that's operating um, in a on a hybrid basis. Committee meetings are conducted in person, but Legislators um, can participate virtually. They are being encouraged to do as much in person as possible. But it's a Friday afternoon, your state rep may be from Greenwich or Northwest Connecticut. Snow is expected. Okay, you do your committee work um, but remotely and you can vote remotely. Committees. Um, the other thing that there is, I think, an appreciation for on public hearings. Um, public hearings, I think now, this is a permanent change. You will have public hearings in person, but there will be a virtual component. And, you know, think about it. it, it the way the rules work in the General Assembly, um, you get three minutes to speak. You may have to wait hours and hours for your turn to get up and speak for three minutes. 
for virtual hearing, you can be at home. If you're working at home, you know, you keep working and your name is called and you say your, your piece and maybe the legislature will have questions. So I think that's permanent. Um, this really pushed them to, I think, go almost paper free. You know, they, um, they have finally realized that you don't need to print out every amendment and, you know, it's all in the computer and the computer works pretty well. And it's transparent. Wherever you are, you can log in and you can see what amendments are filed in real time. So, I mean, those all seem like positives, right? We're wasting less paper, we're wasting less time. It's it's more open and democratic, certainly, if you, people are able to to take part from home. Those all seem like like positives for the most part. And are they being viewed as positives? Oh, I think they are. I, I think as again, it was, there was a lot of resentment last year directed towards the Senate Democratic leader, Marty Looney, because um, the House wanted the building open. So the first two floors of the Capitol, the public could come in, but there were security guards stationed, I'm not making this up, on the landing between the second and the third floor. And, you know, I think people rightly said, well, wait a minute, across the street, there are 3,000 people going to the theater tonight, and you can't go to the third or fourth floors of the Connecticut Capitol. That was, that was very awkward. Um, and again, I, I, we're past that. Um, we are now seeing um, operation that's more like what it was. So, um, Again, public hearings. One of the one of the criticisms Senator Kelly, the Senate Republican leader, had was, you can make a statement simply by showing up, by showing up in numbers, wearing your AARP red T-shirts or your purple SEIU T-shirts. You know, you're saying something. Mm -hmm. You have a presence, and that was missing when the building was shut. That was lost. And as a reporter, what was lost for me is just trying to. You can. You can feel things in that building. You can see things. You can go into a committee meeting and say, all right, I know who these lobbyists are. Why, what brought them here on this agenda? And you get a sense of what is going on. You can literally feel things in that building and that was lost. I, I, a last question along these lines though, in terms of what has changed. So some bits of their work have changed. Some things are going to go back to the way they were. Do you get the sense that lawmakers, maybe even the governor's office too, feels the change in the state in the way that people live and work? I know, for instance, the governor has made quite a quite a big deal over the course of the last couple of years that tens of thousands of people, mostly from New York, have flocked to places, mostly like Litchfield County, where I live, and I've bought up properties and are going to stay in Connecticut. That's one one change for sure. But so many things about people's lives, the way that they commute, the way that they uh, send their kids off to school have changed as well. Do you get the sense that the lawmakers at the Capitol have grasped upon this and are taking that into the way that they write laws during this upcoming session? I haven't seen it change the way they write laws, but it has changed the debates a little bit. Um, you know, take... Uh, commuter rail. You know, commuter rail is still not back to where it was. There are not as many people commuting into Manhattan. Um, I don't think that means um, there's now a groundswell to abandon long-term plans to invest in infrastructure. Um, and the same for, you know, for highway improvements. Um, but that is, um, the question is, how much of a societal change is that? You know, not only in Connecticut, but but elsewhere. Um, you certainly see it in the cities now. Cities are focusing more on developing housing because that's where the market is. You, there, you know, the market for commercial real estate is pretty flat. And um, so that is that is changing things as well. But um, I think it's too soon to see that change it to actual bills. Again, you know, I, I haven't heard anybody suggest that they defund Metro North. 
You, you have provided a perfect segue in radio terms into uh, a couple conversations that I'd like to have about, about housing. We have uh, Steve and Paul both asking questions. Housing costs in Connecticut have risen dramatically. Following the pandemic, do you think the Democratic majority can make any headway on zoning reform to increase the supply of available housing? Um, also questions uh, about you know, whether or not there's any willingness to go to the towns and say, look, we have to do something about affordable housing here. This is a big issue. And it's not just about, as you've written about, and we've talked about Paz, not just about the equity issue of affordable housing. It's really an economic issue. Where are people going to live if they can't afford housing? So there's a bunch of things that are all jumbled up together. So one of the questions uh, is, if you are um, a housing advocate, what do you want? Do you want more housing right away or as, as quickly as you can? Um, if you're desegregate Connecticut, is your primary goal to desegregate or at least make more uh, diverse some of the many suburbs that don't allow um, multifamily housing, either as a matter of right, or there are 20 of them that don't allow it under any circumstance. And multifamily housing in Connecticut is defined as three units. We're not talking big stuff. Um, this governor has, I think, shown repeatedly he does not have the desire or the stomach to go tell communities we're going to mess with your zoning. So the question will be, is there um, the will in the General Assembly? And this is unclear because Governor Malloy tried a fairly modest effort to loosen local control. And he, the legislature, the Democratic legislature slapped back at him. Now, it was a smaller majority then to be sure. But this, the question of messing around with local zoning is very sensitive. I mean, it's not quite a third rail, you know, but it's close to it. So the question will be, so all right, take CBIA. CBIA had that pledge they wanted people to sign. And it was interesting. There were pro-labor Democrats like Senator George Cabrera, who signed on because he liked their push um, for workforce development and housing. So CBIA is speaking language that the governor understands. You need housing if you're gonna have economic growth because you need workforce for growth. You need housing for workforce. Um, but you know, the governor in his state of the state address said, I want ladders, not lifelines. Um, I want, uh, I don't want subsidies, I want sustainability. So the question is when it comes to housing, even if you solve the zoning issue in some of these places, you still have the fact that land is damn expensive in this state. And if you're going to do affordable housing, you're going to have to have some kind of subsidies. You know, the way we have in Hartford with um, with the Connecticut, um, with CERTA, you know, and, and they do a great job. And that's why you have a lot of down, new downtown housing in Hartford at different price points. It's not all... Um, high-end stuff. But uh, yeah, so th then what is what is the state implement to do any of, of this? If indeed there's an economic imperative, if, if Governor uh, Lamont will listen to CBIA and say, we need workforce housing. It means money. It means putting money into these programs. So the way that developers get to do a product at a lower rent is if you have blended financing, if you have public money goes in with the private financing, and that's what we have in, in Hartford. Um, and, but again, that's going to require the governor say, we're going to, we're going to borrow, we're going to put more money into this. Um, we're going to use some of that surplus. Um, so the governor so far, he did a shout out about housing is an important issue in his speech, but he is yet to show his hand as to what that means. We've got a few more questions coming in on Zoom. We also have some questions here live in our audience. Hi there. What's your name and what's your question? Um, my name is Dave Pickus. Um, my question actually is... He looks great in purple t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I wasn't going to necessarily lead with that. On the other hand, um, the... the uh, the housing question is extremely important because otherwise workers can't work. And as we saw with the COVID thing, um, nursing homes and their workers um, suffered 
tremendously in terms of the amounts of death and, and, and destruction that took place. Um, but one of the other things dealing also with housing is energy. And there's been no mention of energy. Um, the costs for the electric bills are going close to double. Natural gas is up. It's, we're fortunate it's not that cold. What is being discussed, particularly you got a progressive caucus, but what is being discussed the price of energy in Connecticut is the highest in the country. And, and is there anything being discussed to change that, which I believe would also have an impact on the other issues that you're talking about? It, it would have an impact. Um, there are some countervailing sort of forces at work here. Um, so the state's long-term plan is to step away from fossil fuels. Um, but um, right now, Electricity, you know, is generated. The electricity that we use in Connecticut, it's generated by nuclear uh, and by natural gas. And that's a problem because we are at the end of the pipelines on natural gas. Um, you, uh, you know, and, and when I had notes for this, I was, I had this list of things I call it yin and yang. It's, it's uh, bills where you have different bills at loggerheads. So we have bills to again, move the state along as far as uh, getting away from fossil fuels. And there's also bills to make it easier to bring pipelines in here. The Connecticut deregulated the generation of electricity, as you know, a while ago. It's pretty hard to put that toothpaste back in the tube. Um, so half of our electric bill is set by the market. Um, it's it's only half, and that's roughly is the part that is regulated, which is the transmission lines of Eversource and United Illuminating and the handful of of small um, providers. So there's no easy answer on that. There are some bills in that are simplistic that aren't going to go anywhere. There's, there are bills that would um, put the issue before you put rates before the General Assembly. I don't know. I don't think anybody thinks that's a great idea. Having the Connecticut General Assembly voting on electric rates. Um, get get generators if they ever go that way. Um, and so, I mean, that, that's a hard one. I mean, people have been working on this issue for 30 years without much success. Well, now, I, but part of it, but the yeah, promise is yeah, with the renewables, yeah. are we at a point where there's going to be critical mass on, on offshore wind in a couple of years? You know, I don't know. Well, it, it, but people who are in the renewable energy business will say, you know, the prices have come down substantially, obviously. So it's much more competitive. We don't have it ramped up by anywhere near the means necessary to take place of natural gas. We also invested heavily in natural gas over the course of the last couple of administrations, because that was supposed to be our bridge fuel to the future. Remember all of this. That was going to be a 10-year bridge that's now been about a 20-year bridge. And so I think that this is one, this is another place where the Democrats, Mark, are, are, are stuck maybe between factions here. You really do have an awful lot of people who for 30 years have been pushing us to get off of fossil fuels. We didn't make any headway really in that uh, compared to other parts of the, the country or other parts of the world. And now we're stuck with the highest electric rates and no real, real way out. We've got one nuclear plant that provides about half of our electricity. That's, that's old. I mean, that's got to be a, a political uh, difficulty for this governor to not be able to solve increasing electric rates that are just going to be cutting into everyone's household bills every month. It is. And the challenge is there's no quick fixes, right? Everything has a long lead time. You know, the wind projects um, that are planned um, off, off the shore, you know, the, you know, the Connecticut, Connecticut is ramping up to serve that with the state pier project in New London, which has turned into a bit of a boondoggle, a lot of uh, cost overruns. Uh, um, it's been an embarrassment for the administration. Um, but I don't, I don't see anybody in the general assembly who's honestly, who's seriously suggesting you step away from from wind. But whatever it is you do, there are siting issues. Um, if you go up in the hill behind my house at yeah. Winstead, you can see the only onshore a wind farm. It's two little propellers uh, up in Colebrook, and there ain't no more going up anytime soon because people want that in their backyard about as much as they want a trash to energy plant. 
And if, if you want to mess with a, a liberal environmentalist, tell them there's a wind project that's going up in their town. And I don't mean to make fun of them because anything you do, there's an impact, right? Um, electric cars, I now have a plug-in hybrid and you know that's great, but you know there's an impact to mining lithium. There's an impact to all of it. Um, and that is why energy stuff is, uh, you know, any anytime, and this actually happens from time to time, you know, kids will ask me, what's a good idea for a school paper? And I always say energy, pick whatever it is, because there is a downside, even if it's wind, even if it's, you know, battery powered cars, you know, nothing, none of this stuff is free until we figure out, you know, fishing. You know. Uh um, we have a series of questions coming up, and I want to talk to you about this anyway. One of the things that has been in the mix at the General Assembly for as long as you and I have been doing this is, is aid in dying. Some people call it assisted suicide. Whether or not uh, this, this bill or bills will make it to a vote, what do we, what do we think this time around? Because we have been talking about this for a very long time indeed, Pass. I believe this is the 15th year that a version of this bill has been filed. Um, it's a fascinating issue because people who feel in control of their lives say, of course, we should do this. You should have the right, if you are terminally ill, to decide um, the time and manner of your death. The opposition is, is really, the disability community is the strongest uh, lobbying group against this bill, which this this concept, which is in, I think, 11 or 12 states. Um, the proponents of aid and dying say, look, there's a track record in other states. Um, there are few, if any, signs of abuse. But, you know, the disability community, again, people who have had to fight not to be marginalized, these are the folks, along with the Catholic Church, who are the strongest voices about this. So, um, this has had trouble getting through the Judiciary Committee. Um, it's gotten out of public health. There was uh, you know, some cuteness in parliamentary stuff last time. Um, so right now, we'll, we'll see if they've tightened the language enough about how it would actually work to um, address some of the concerns that it could be abused. But this will, this will be a, an interesting one to watch this session. Are, are there others that have been in the hopper, as they say, for many, many years that are back again this year, maybe for just another go around, may, maybe might actually get some traction this time around? Well, yes. I mean, so the labor bills, um, they have a number of of measures in that regard, things that come up, and sometimes it takes multiple years to paid family medical leave, for, for example. Sure. But you know, one of them is what used to be called the Walmart bill, um, which is basically um, the idea of uh, if you have these companies that aren't paying, uh, that aren't giving health benefits, and if there's, and if they are basically pushing their employees to take advantage of state programs, you know, um, Husky, you know, health coverage, should those companies be penalized? Should they be forced to pony up? So that bill is, is back. Um, it's a bill that, um, uh, whether it goes forward, usually is how it's defined, how big a company um, will it apply to franchisers, which can be a big national company, but you do have an impact on smaller businesses that are the franchisees. Um, th that's that's one that comes up a lot. There are other labor ones. You know, there's a scheduling bill, right? Um, we now have a service economy where you have people who make a living by stitching together you know, maybe two part-time jobs and scheduling is a big deal to them. They're trying to coordinate or you uh, single parent, they get a babysitter to go to work and they show up and they're told go home because, you know, it's a restaurant and business is slow. So there are things like that. Um, areas in which um, used to be probably the sole province of collective bargaining, um, but now um, you see it played out at the Connecticut General Assembly. Um, a, a question here from Fred that I think really gets to the heart of some of the stuff that you're able to tell us in your day-to-day -day coverage for how many years now with the Connecticut Beer? 
The mirror um, has a birthday tomorrow. It, um, it launched 13 years ago on uh, the 25th of January. The Congra Congratulations. That's great. And how long have you been covering the Capitol? Too long. Um, I, I added up um, working for the Journal Enquirer for five years, the Hartford Current for 24, and now the Mirror for 13. I have not covered the Capitol the whole time because I'd be retired. I'd be nuts. But um, it's my 27th session as far as I wow. did a quick. Yeah, I know. Congratulations. I don't know if that. I don't know. Is that the right word? Is that the right? Um, anyway, <laughs> that is a preface. One of the things you're able to do by being there, getting to know these folks, is, is answer a question like the one that Fred has here, which is, can you identify a few legislators, especially those who are not publicity hounds, that's in, <laughs> that's in parentheses, Fred wrote that, not me, who are constructive, helpful, try to work collaboratively with legislators with differing viewpoints? Because this is the sort of thing when we send people to the state house or we send people to Washington, we sort of want people who are going to do that work, right? They're going to work across the aisle. They're going to be, they're going to be productive, but they're, they're going to listen to people of other viewpoints. They're going to represent us in that way. Do you have any yeah, ideas? About yeah. That? I mean, actually there are many of them. Um, and even some who on occasion want, want the publicity because publicity helps feed reelection. But, you know, as long as I do this, I mean, I try to guard against becoming cynical about the people I, I cover. Um, this, these are people who, you know, use Teddy Roosevelt's line. I mean, these are people who are in the arena and, and in the era of social media, you know, there's a lot of crap they take. Um, so, you know, I think there are a lot in both parties who are there to legislate. Some arrive as kind of firebrands and then they have to learn how to legislate. You know, Josh Elliott, um, who uh, liberal Democrat, he challenged a former house speaker. He was gonna primary him. Um, and Brendan Sharkey, the speaker ultimately didn't run and Josh won. And Josh's first year, he had an agenda. He had an idea of what the Democratic Party should be doing. And he had a spreadsheet. And he had each and every one of his Democratic colleagues on that spreadsheet. And he rated them on any number of issues. And this really made Josh largely popular in his caucus. Um, well, after two years, he kind of learned to tone it down. Um, Matt Ritter decided, I'm going to make you responsible for things and see how that works. And he gave him a committee chair. And, and so Josh is somebody who learned how to legislate, you know, um, the legislature, you know, you are probably going to go there eventually, but I, I, I'll mention Quentin Williams, who, yeah. who was this wonderful young man who was killed driving home from the inaugural ball. And, you know, Quentin Williams was somebody who, uh, he was very popular because he big personality, big laugh, big, you know, but he was learning how to legislate. And so you had, you know, he's a black Democrat from Middletown, but was clearly learning how you build coalitions. And in all the tributes that were posted to him, uh, the one that, you know, I, I kind of struck me was one posted by Tom O'Day, who is a Democratic, I'm mean, sorry, a deputy Republican leader in the House. He's from New Canaan. And there were pictures of O'Day and Williams. You know, uh, they, they met in Middletown where Williams represented on issues. And then Williams went to New Canaan. And I thought, this is a guy who has, has he knows the game. Right. Mm -hmm. The fact that, you know, he can go and sit with Tom O'Day and and figure, build a relationship. That's what drives the General Assembly. And there are other people like that. And there are people who are certainly all about getting business done. You know, Ritter has picked. Oh, by the way, and, and Quentin, Ritter had picked Quentin Williams to take over as co-chair of the Labor Committee. I did not know Quentin Williams really well, but I. I cover the Labor Committee pretty closely because it's very interesting as far as policy and politics. So I was really looking forward to seeing how this guy was going to operate 
mm. in that in that arena. Um, and, and, you know, to the sorrow of Connecticut, we won't see that. Yeah, it's a huge loss. Um, we've got a question over here. I think I know who, who is going to ask the question, but why don't you say your name for our audience? Sure. Bilal Siku, uh, teacher at the University of Hartford. Hi, Professor. <laughs> How you doing? The one area you didn't cover um, really is the sort of democracy area, which is one I'm very interested in. This year, they've got to figure out what um, early voting will look like. And so there are a number of proposals that will be out there about what that looks like. Um, the issue of no excuse absentee voting potentially may come up. And I'm just sort of curious about what you're hearing about what those bills are looking like, what the sort of interest is. I know the Secretary of State has laid out her ideas about it, and certainly there are a lot of advocacy groups that have ideas as well, and lawmakers. So what are you hearing around there about those two issues, but democracy issues in general? Yeah, and I just want to say, and this is an important point too, I, you know, a lot of people in Connecticut, they go to the polls this last time around, and they see this this question, and I think a lot of people pass think, okay, well, good, we, we've we've done something about this question of can we vote early? Can we vote differently in Connecticut? And no, as usual, the legislature has to do something about this. Well, right, but the restriction that was in the Constitution is gone on early voting. It remains on um, no excuse absentee balloting, although it is a little bit more flexible as a result of a lot of those past. But Early voting is certainly going to pass. The question will be how many days, which is actually the easiest question to resolve, right? Um, you know, it's the if you the the Secretary of State's office released a report that was done. It was commissioned by Denise Merrill um, uh, when she had the office, and it gives uh, a template. There were four models that were suggested. But the really, the interesting part isn't going to be how many days. Are we going to have the weekend before? Are we going to have 10 days before? Are we going to have 20 days? It's really going to be where you go and how you vote. And then um, one of the recommendations is, um, so how do you make this work financially in these small towns? You know, So don't think in terms of your regular election day where you go to the auditorium or the gym and you know there are checkers and all this it's probably going to be more you go to uh town hall you go to the clerk's office and it's going to be similar to voting by absentee ballot i think that seems to be where well it's one of it's one of the models that that's suggested and if you think about it it's pretty practical it's pretty cost effective you go to the clerk's office you ask for a ballot and it's the same as getting absentee ballot you but it, you fill it out there and it and it goes into the tabulator or it goes into a lockbox to be tabulated later. So um, so they'll be they'll be pushing and pulling over how many days out you do it. Um, I forgot what the median is. Um, I think it's a couple of weeks, but um, the recommendation so far of the of the new Secretary of the State is 10 days. Is there a sense that Connecticut is basing this on best practices they've seen elsewhere in the country because most of the rest of the country has already learned how to do this? Well, there's a cultural aspect to it, right? And, you know, I've been a reporter in Connecticut a long time, and I have to admit, you know, the first time you see a national study that describes Connecticut as one of the most restrictive states as far as ballot access. I mean, that put me back on my heels because when I think of restrictions and ballot access, I think of the Deep South. I think of the places, the counties that consolidated voting places um, and certainly like black counties where you have to travel now and it you know, ends up with long, long lines. I don't think of Connecticut that way because by and large, um, when we do have long lines, it's usually because if it was either a problem or, um, you know, and didn't print enough ballots, didn't print enough ballots, or the kids at Yale all discovered it was election day and they wanted to go to City Hall and all take advantage of election day registration, which happened one year. Um, but but yeah, Connecticut does not have the same comfort level. I mean, you we so COVID was a great test for this. You know, we got a dry run on um, voting more by mail. Um, some states, they vote almost entirely by mail. Some states, you get not a ballot application automatically, you get a ballot. And not only did the state not break, 
but we had record turnouts. Well, but the right, but added, you know, an added problem here now is the election deniers, how polarized it has become. Um, you know, President Trump, who has attacked voting by mail, um, attacked uh, voting by absentee, to the dismay of many county Republican executives who had pretty damn good absentee ballot operations. Um, you know, I mean, I think there's certainly evidence that Trump shot himself in the foot with, with turning his base off to um, <laughs> easy voting. Uh, we just have a, a couple minutes left, which is a little bit after eight o'clock. I, I want to ask, Paz, if there's anything else that you're looking for this time around in this legislative session. Thank you, by the way, to, for all the great questions that we've had from, from folks. Sometimes there's, there's, I was going to say loony bills. I don't mean Martin loony bills, but I mean just kind of outlandish bills that, that, that people propose. Sometimes there's other things that you really think might gain a little bit of traction because, as you say, it does take momentum sometimes at the state capitol. What are some of the things you're really looking for this legislative session? Well, I wouldn't want to be a black bear in Connecticut. I have a feeling... I have a feeling hunting is, is going to be allowed. Hunting for black bears. Right. Um, you know, there's a there's a bill that Senator Looney put in that doesn't quite fit that description, but I keep going back to it. But, you know, so Senator Looney um, has been around forever. Um, he was first elected to General Assembly in 1980 to the House. Um, and he's a student of history. But so he has a bill in that it says an act codifying certain decisions of the Supreme Court. I'm like, what the hell is this? Because, you know, Connecticut codified Roe v. Wade 30 years ago. And people laughed at it. It's like, what is this about? Roe v. Wade's not going anywhere. Well, obviously that turned out to be pretty damn prescient. So Looney has a bill that would codify four Supreme Court decisions. So one of them is Miranda. You know, you read your rights. Another one is Gideon, which created establishing the right to a lawyer if you can't afford one. Um, it was what? It was Gideon. It was Gideon Miranda. I actually have it here. This one is cheap, but it was funny because there's one I I I had never heard of. Um, hang on. This is what happens during one of these Zoom events. You just pause. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, you just. It's not like we're on the damn radio where you're. I saw the radio. You yeah, gotta do a radio show with him. He's always going, "Come on, come on, come on, come on." Talk faster, Paz. Here, it's just like take all the time you want. Doesn't matter. Oh, of course. I, oh, shame on me. Griswold, Connecticut one, right? Yeah. Um, about contraception, but then there was one I hadn't heard of, and it's a pretty good educated group. Let me see if anybody knows this case. Plyler, Plyler versus Doe. Anybody know what this is? It was a Texas case. It established the right to public education for undocumented children. Now, is that ever going to be an issue in Connecticut? Who knows? But Marty Looney has that bill in, and, and I'm going to be interested to see if this goes forward. It's obviously a statement in part but it's an interesting little thing. And that's sort of the fun of, of being in this business and seeing what these people come up with. I, I like the idea that I asked for loony bills and you literally gave me loony bills. It's almost like we planned this. One of the challenges of being a reporter covering the Connecticut Journal Assembly is not to do puns off of loonies. <laughs> It's probably for the best. We'll leave it there. Mark Pazniokas, Capitol Bureau Chief of the Connecticut Mirror. Give him a nice round of applause here for our audience at the Wild Auditorium. This event, as, as I said, was made possible in part through the support of CBIA. You can learn more about CBIA's 2023 Transform Connecticut Policy Solutions at CBIA.com. Also want to thank the folks at the President's College at the University of Hartford for hosting this event at the Wild Auditorium. And if you want to learn more about their lifelong learning program, check out the spring 2023 program at hartford.edu slash PC. We also have two more of these events coming up. They're both Zoom events, so you don't have to jo join us in person. You can join them 
uh, from the privacy of your own home. One is coming up on Tuesday, January 31st. It's a roundtable with a few Connecticut Mirror reporters who work on a variety of beats. The other one is February 15th, and that's with uh, Keith Faneff. It's the big budget review. We'll be talking about some more of these issues and getting into the budget implications thereof. They're both at seven o'clock. They're both Zoom events. You can register at ctmirror.org. And when you go to ctmirror.org, just click on that big donate button. You know, um, public policy and politics reporting is not cheap to produce. It's something that is going away in an awful lot of places. Many of you have probably subscribed to newspapers in the past, newspapers that are a shadow of their former selves. Places like the Connecticut Mirror exist because people give money directly. That doesn't mean a ton of money. You don't have to you know, give us thousands of dollars, although our publisher, Bruce uh, Putterman, is here. He will happily accept a check. Um, but your very small contribution actually goes a long way to support the work that Paz has been doing for so long, that Keith has been doing, all of our new, young, very hungry reporters of the Connecticut Mirror. So please consider a donation to support nonprofit, nonpartisan journalism at the Connecticut Mirror. I'm John Dankosky. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a great night.